Welcome to the garage. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Peter Clayton's behind the camera. Welcome to the Court of Public Opinion. And if it's in the news, on your mind, close to your heart, getting up your nose, on your chest, I hope it's going to be something we will cover here in the Court of Public Opinion. But in any case, on Friday, when we go live streaming on jeremycordo.com, you can uh, bring up stuff that maybe we've missed. I don't know. We can't be everywhere. And speaking of being everywhere, we were talking yesterday about this pharmacy business where the pharmacists say that they will go broke if the government has its way and allows people to have two months medication uh, or medicine. Uh, instead of doing a prescription for one month, you can have two months. Now, Pete tells me he reckons that it's because if you go in with a prescription for one month, you only you get two months worth of medicine, but only pay for one month. Now, Pete, I don't know. That would be insane. Well, I'm pretty sure that's correct, and that's what the pharmacy. Well, I can understand that. You, you're not getting. You're not just because you can save some shoe leather by not going to the pharmacy to get a second prescription filled doesn't mean that you don't pay for the second prescription. That's what I couldn't understand anybody objecting to. It was just a convenience thing. There's only one script now. It's one script, but for two months. I believe that's the case. But you would charge precisely what was being prescribed. One month would be a certain number of dollars. Two months would be a certain number of dollars. You pay for the one script. You don't pay for the script. You pay for the, what the chemist passes over at the cash register. I'm pretty sure I'm right, but I'll All right. swear to it. All right. Well, we'll run that up the flagpole and see. We'll see. Uh, the Reserve Bank, soon to be former head, one Dr. Philip Lowe, gave a very interesting address on Friday. I, last Friday. I don't know if you heard it. Almost apologising for doing his job well. Doing his job well. You see, as I see it, the government needed a villain. The government was responsible, really, for one of the single most important ingredients in inflation. One of the big drivers. And that is the cost of energy, because that's reflected in everything we buy, everything we do, every place we go. The government is totally responsible for the high cost of electricity, not the war in Ukraine, believe me. Their pursuit of renewables and their demand that all coal-fired power stations be closed, keeping in mind, of course, that Australia contributes next to nothing to global emissions, 1.3%. What they don't tell us is that the wetlands and floodplains produce about the same emissions as power stations. And the worst gas of all, which is methane. And no one says a word. Wetlands are in, coal, of course, is out. It is a stupid policy and mantra. And where is the media? Uh, taking its forelock and, I don't know, hoping for a good secure job in the public service. I don't know what drives them. Certainly not curiosity or good journalism. It's not that these people are stupid. They're not. It is that they think we are stupid. Let's be clear. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer needed a villain. Let's blame the interest rates on Dr. Philip Lowe. Ah, not the high cost of electricity, which of course affects, as I said, just about everything. Our cost of living can mostly be attributed to the government's energy policy. No thought about the people, just the ideology. And as inflation rose, the man whose job it was to control became the diversion. He was going to be the punching bag for doing his job. And he went on doing his job knowing that that set him up this way. Suffering public odium, I mean. He has nothing to apologise for. 
Had he not lifted the interest rates, inflation would have got a lot worse and the country would have been in more serious trouble. I don't understand why he didn't get a second term and I'm quite sure that Dr Lowe doesn't understand either. But we'll see how it unfolds. More than 100,000 people have crossed the English Channel in tiny boats since 2018. It's not long ago. 100,000 people. I mentioned in our live broadcast on Friday, jeremycordo.com, that 20 million people, asylum seekers, are on the move at any one time looking for a better place to live and who could blame them. We've got to deal with this. We have to. The only reason we're not more affected is simply we've got a great big moat around us. Dealing with it means dealing with all of those tin pot, despot dictators in Africa. And that will not be easy. They, along with some governments, not all, but some, do not care a damn about the people. But where is the United Nations, I wonder, set up in 90, 1945 to look after things like this? This should be their job. For the average African, that place is a hellhole. There have been, according to my brief research, coups in seven countries. Military coups, mostly. That's in less than two years. People knock colonisation. I know. It's fashionable. It's the in thing. But under the British, or the French, or the Germans, or the Portuguese, the Spanish, the people never, never suffered the way they're suffering now. They were never involved in a mass exodus, risking their lives. You can imagine how desperate they must be to risk their lives. Refugees out of dozens of these failed African states prepared to risk, risk their lives just to get the hell out of there. What do we do about it? We're trying to cope with the refugee problem. What we have to do is not look to cope with the effect or fix the effect. We've got to go to the cause. And that's what the United Nations should be doing. And all the time, in back of all of this anti-colonial stuff, in back of all of this is Russia. You know, the, the Wagners, they're in there and they are prodding and being paid and they are causing more pain, more bloodshed, more refugees. And again I say, where is the United Nations? No condemnation. I mean, where is Penny Wong? I haven't heard Penny Wong say a word about any of this. Okay, it's not in our backyard, but it's still an important thing to talk about. This is something completely different. Change the subject altogether. I know this is not in the in the realm of overall realm of things Im important. Probably not very important at all. But when you look at the number of people in the entertainment business, it's a very big employer, one way or another. And you look at some of the stupid decisions that have been made, not by the industry, but again by government, both liberal and Labour. Stupid decisions. A television licence or a radio licence was a licence to either make money, if you were good at it, or, of course, lose money. All this new legislation that came in when they moved us to the digital world, the digital platforms, as they like to... <laughs> I mean, I worked for a radio station briefly, <laughs> and they didn't talk about the radio station, they talked about the platform. <laughs> Stupid. It's a radio station. Platform rubbish. Anyway, the bait that the government put on the table, the incentive, was from having one or two radio stations, you could have eight. Oh, happy days. What could possibly go wrong? 
dozens of extra stations in every city, dozens of them, all for free. So now the audience could choose from hundreds of different stations around the nation, which didn't include the 200,000 radio stations worldwide that you could listen to on your smartphone. See? No thought. Too much choice. Too much choice. Confusing in the extreme. But even worse, the audience didn't grow. The choices did. The audience cake has been cut too many ways. They now find it hard to get a critical mass. Eight stations per license, same sized audience. Beware the government bearing gifts, I say. No one has a big enough slice of the cake to make any financial sense. Too much choice. At least with JeremyCordo.com, and this is what we all think now, and I must admit I had to be convinced a little bit, being a bit of a Luddite, no, a lot of a Luddite, was the future. I'm now convinced it is the future. You can go to JeremyCordo.com on Friday, and we're only beginning with one three-hour program once a week. But you can go there and you can know exactly what you're getting. Open-minded, open-hearted, free speech, and opinions, of course. Opinions with which you will not always agree, but that's fine. But there will be no fence sitting. Uh, have I got time for one more? Yeah. An interesting thought, ladies and gentlemen, one that could revolutionise the world. If we could force the government to make inflation tax deductible, think about it, inflation would disappear almost overnight. It would. What inflation does is to devalue our money. Clearly that loss, I don't know, inflation 5-6% should be deductible. We should be able to claim our losses, I would think. You see what I mean? If you have an investment earning say 3% and the inflation rate is running at 6%, you have lost 3%. You haven't made any money at all. Yet you'll be taxed on the interest earnings of 3%. But in fact you've lost 3% thanks to the government. Now that 3% that you've lost or we've lost should be tax deductible. Claim your losses. Have a think about it. Make inflation tax deductible. That could turn the world around. Because the government would not like its loss of revenue one little bit. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to mount something of a campaign around that. We'll talk more about that on Friday. Thank you very much for being with us in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Thank you very much for your support. I try to answer all the comments that come in on my dates. I got carried away. <laughs> my trouble. My trouble is, of course, I, t I talk too much and I figure we don't have any time left. Some dates? We got time for dates? Okay? Yes. How's the battery going? Good. Okay. <laughs> August uh, 15. Oh, look at that. 1308. 1308. My brother, Knights of St. John. Conquer Rhodes. Wow. An honour to be amongst you, sirs. Uh, 1308, wow. Uh, 1937, Janet Mead, Adelaide girl. Janet Mead, Catholic nun, pop rock singer. The Lord's Prayer, born in Adelaide. Oh, she died in 19... No, in 2022, I didn't know that. But she was born in 1937 on this day. 1769, Napoleon Bonaparte, French military leader and emperor of France was born in Corsica in 1769. Wiley Post, American aviator, first solo flight around the world, killed in a plane crash in Alaska in... Oh, he's only 36. 
but he was killed on this day in 1935. Ben Affleck, American Academy Award winning screen writer, goodwill hunting actor, all the rest, Armageddon, Pearl Harbor, BAFTA award winning director, born in Berkeley, California in 72. Macbeth, King of the Scots, slain in battle by his son, King Duncan. He was about 52 years old, 1057. Imagine being killed by your own son in battle. You'd think your kids would be on your side, wouldn't you? Hell's bells. Uh, Stieg Larsson, Swedish author, girl with the dragon tattoo, very big selling book. I've never read it, but I know people who have and loved it and the movie. Born in Sweden. He died in 2004, but he was born this day in 1954. Uh, Queen Mary of Scotland arrives in France at the age of six in 1548. The Beatles play to their largest crowd ever. 55,000 people at the Shear Stadium, New York. Among those in attendance were his future wives, or the Beatles' future wives, Barbara Back and Linda Eastman. That was 1965. American philanthropist and co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Melinda Gates, born in Dallas, Texas, in 1964. And Ignatius of Leola co-founds the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, uh, as in uh, the St. Ignatius School, 1534. And one more, oh, <laughs> Jack Russell. Now, this is not the guy who named the dogs, is it? No. Oh, no. Jack Russell, English cricketer and wicketkeeper, uh, he was born in England in uh, 1963. <laughs> hey, Missy, do you want to come and say hello? You can hop up, hop up, hop up. Oh! <laughs> say goodbye to everyone. This, this is Missy. Missy, yeah, lovely girl. Missy. And did you bring a ball to play with? No. Say goodbye to everyone. <laughs> Thanks for viewing. See you tomorrow in the Court of Public Opinion and again live streaming on Friday. Bye.